Morning Year 6, we are carrying on with Chapter 27 today and hopefully finishing Chapter 28 of Sky Song. So, if you remember, halfway through Chapter 27, they heard a voice, didn't they? Okay, so they were taken um, to find the Grey Man by Winter, um, by the Polar Bears, sorry. Yeah, by White Fur, brilliant, yep. Yeah. And if you remember very carefully, at the very, very end, it said, it won't be long before the Ice Queen steals your voice completely, Flynn said to Esker. And what? And just two days until midnight sun rises. So where on earth is this grey man? Over here came a tart reply. Okay, so they finally found the grey man. Okay, so we'll just carry on from where we, where we left off. Esker jumped. The voice belonged to a man with a high, almost weedy voice, which might have gone unnoticed had Flint been talking more loudly. Well... Don't just stand there gawping, the, back, the voice squeaked. I've got a headache, a broken leg, a sore back and a sprained knee. I very obviously need help. Blue crouch, clutched onto Flynn's hand. Who's this? Who there? The voice came again, even higher and crosser than before. No one comes my way for almost a year and then you three show up like a trio of gasping buffoons. There was a sigh. And right under your nose, as you know, Esker glanced at a little mold of, mound of snow in front of her. You don't think... Balapan leapt down from her shoulder and Eska brushed a handful of snow aside to reveal a, he a heap of small rocks. The reedy voice sounded again. It was louder this time and it came straight from the rocks themselves. Why are humans always so confoundly stupid? Flint stared at the rocks. How, how can they be speaking? Like this, the voice snapped. Blue bent down and lifted up a long, thin rock. Do you mind? The voice muttered. That's my arm. Eska's eyes widened. Jay's words about the grey man. She forced her voice on. He'll be in pieces in light of what's been going on. In pieces. The grey man is literally in pieces. The rocks looked 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 fed up. If rocks could look that way. Clever clogs. Blink, Flint blinked. The ice queen must have torn him down into battle. Maybe we need to build him back into a person so that he can help us. The voice sighed. Yes, you do. Before the sun sets too. Because I have absolutely no confidence in you working in the dark. There was a pause. So what are your... So what... What would you be so kind as to pass me an arm? Ignoring the ice man, the grey man's demands, Flint lifted an oval rock up from the pile and placed it in the snow. This could be a face, he murmured, if you squint at it hard enough. Of course it's my face, you blumbering idiot, the, the voice inside the rock bark, barked out. Balapan raked her talons across a rounder rock. Be careful, that's my bottom. It's gone rather numb after all this lying down in one place. But I'm still fond of it. In fact, I'd say it's one of my best features. Down on their hands and knees, Esker, Flint, Balapan, Blue and even Pebble worked as quickly as they could to put the pieces of the Grey Man back together. Put your back into it, the rock squeaked. I mean, put my back into it and my hands. I'll be needing them if you want some help from me. And although the conversation was somewhat stressful and Blue seemed determined to place the, the Grey Man's foot on top of his head and Pebble spent far too much time using his tail to flick stones at Flint's bottom, they did eventually manage to cobble together a figure with the rocks. There was a moment of silence as the group looked at their creation arranged in the snow. Now what? Flint hissed. The grey man lay there in the verge, of, in the vague shape of a man. His face was a blank stone still. There was no mouth, no nose, no eyes. And yet the creaky voice came again. Now this, it chuckled. Finally this. As he spoke, the snow around him whipped up into a flurry and the stones began to move. They ground together like rusty jolts. Then the grey man stood up and on the stood up and the stone that was his head, a face showed, an old wrinkled face carved into the rock itself and spotted with lichen. Two grey eyes blinked. Am I tall and splendid? Eska squinted. The man came up to her knee. But the feather tribe's song, Flint murmured as he glanced towards the grey man. He said he was tall and he needs to be if he's going to help us find our way to the frost horn. There was an awkward pause. I knew it, the grey man wailed. I'm small, aren't I? He raised a rocky palm to his forehead. Oh, dismantle my legs, lop off my head and cast me off the edge of this cliff. Blue reached out a hand and patted him on the head. You being silly now. That wretched ice queen, the grey man snivelled. When she cast me down, she stripped me of my devilishly attractive height. She said there was no more room for giants in her Erkenwald. Flint's jaw hardened. Well, this isn't her Erkenwald, it's ours. And this time, Esker didn't have, a prompt, have to prompt Flint to ramage through his rucksack for an invention. He ripped the bag open and pulled out stop, unstoppered, pulled out a stoppered bottle. Under the fading light, Esker saw a jet black liquid within the glass that every now and again flickered gold. What's that? The grey man said suspiciously. 
Bottled lightning, Flint replied. A few drops can drastically increase an object's size or speed. Are you sure, boy? The grey man waggled his fingers at Flint. Because I might have an allergy to it, and I don't really want... Blue, it appeared, didn't much have patience for the grey man's allergies, and before he could get another word out, she grabbed the bottle from Flint and began tipping the liquid all over the man. Flint snatched the bottle back before she could drain the whole thing. I need the rest of this for something else, Blue. Something important. For a few seconds, nothing happened, and then the grey man gasped. He was growing. Before their very eyes, the rocks that formed his body swelled to become boulders. The stones that were his fingers stretched out into plinths, and the rocks that, I, that were his hands grew until they were as big as a door. The grey man creaked his neck and his voice came forth in a deep boom. I've forgotten how splendid it feels to be a giant. Blue patted Flint on the back. You are the best inventor, Flint beamed. We've come for the frost horn, Esker whispered to the grey man. Well, of course you have. I didn't think you'd drop by with the Urkemold bears for a cup of tea. So how do we get down to the shore without dying, Flint asked. The grey man waved a hand casually. Oh, it's just a hop, a skip and a jump. Would you like a ride on my shoulder or my head? Both will be equally as uncomfortable. Chapter 28, Esker. They chose the grey man's shoulder, partly because it was a flatter surface, but mostly because when Blue tried to steal the giant's nose to reach his forehead, the giant had sneezed and Blue had co was coated in a thick layer of slime. Esker, Flint, Blue and Pebble sat on the grey man's shoulder with a sack of feathers, silently envying ballad pans gliding above. The sky above was pink and the, and the sea around the icebergs almost purple as the light finally faded. Esker swallowed. Somewhere out there was a legendary frost horn and time was running out to claim it. The giant strayed back quite some way from the cliff edge. We're sort of in a hurry, Esker whispered. Aren't you going the wrong way? You must never underestimate the wrong way, the grey man thundered, because more often than not, it turns out to be the right way, just with a few extra bends in the road. Flint nodded warily. Yet another detour. The giant spun around and Esco and her friends clung to the rocky crevices of his shoulder. Then the grey man took an enormous stride forward, then another and another, and Esco dug her fingers into the cracks of the stone. Hold on, the grey man hollowed. It's been a while since I made the jump and I've no idea if my back will hold out during the descent. A look of horror washed over Flint's face, but Blue grinned. Whee, she shouted as the giant leapt from the cliff. I tell Tom can I jump with a giant? They plummeted down, 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 and with Balapan at their side, past the puffins and the gully moats crammed into the rocky ledges, and Esker's stomach lurched. And run from wolves, Blue giggled. The horror plastered across Flint's face deepened, and then they landed on the snowy beach with a very large and slightly painful bump. The grey man dusted a chunk of lichen from his leg. Not bad, considering. Esker breathed out, and as she watched Balapan preening her feathers nearby, she thought how much less complicated life would be if she was an eagle. Still, they had made it down to the shore. A drop, many of, a drop, many of the feather tribe had died attempting, and before them now was the sea, dark purple and loaded with icebergs. There was a harp, there was harp seals and bearded seals dotted here and there on the flat icebergs nearby. But further out, on the bridges, leaning towers, columned arches, and py and pyramids chiselled out of ice, there was nothing at all. Esca thought of her ma suddenly and wondered whether she had stood on this beach and swum in the waters that broke over it. The grey man lifted the group from his shoulder and sat them down on the shore. They listened to the creak and the jostle of the icebergs moving. The frost horn, the giant said quietly, you'll find it among the last of the groaning splinters, he, get, he paused. I must say more, but the truth is, I don't know anymore. I just remember, many moons ago, that the greatest of the sky gods left it there after breathing life into Urkenwald. Flint glanced at the driftwood lying across the beach and swung his sack of feathers on the ground. I have a plan. A rough one for when, well, if, we can get the frost horn, he sighed. But how do you even get out to the furthest iceberg in the first place? That's a jungle of ice. We'll need a canoe to steer us through. The grey man knelt down beside them, or a very, very convenient wind. He didn't explain any more, and minutes later the last of the colour drained from the sky and night crawled in. Esker's pink skin prickled. There would only be a few hours of darkness. The nights were getting shorter with every day that passed. Then dawn would break and they'd be just one day away from the midnight sun. You can't go on now, said the grey man. It's too dark and you'll need rest and food. Pebbles snuffled in agreement. But I'll take you, I'll take you at first light. The grey man stepped back and only, when, only then did Esker notice the abandoned igloo behind him. The slabs of snow were slightly mishappened, battered over the months of the winter storms, but it was good enough shelter for the night and the group hurried towards it. It'll keep guard through the dark nights. I'll keep dark through the dark nights, the grey man said, settling himself down on a rock by the shore. He dropped his legs into the water and smiled. It's good to be home. 
Flint and Blue laid out furs inside the igloo while Esker clambered up the cliffs with Balapan. The eagle cracked open the gull eggs and drained the yolks there and then, but Esker pocketed as many as she could carry and stole back to the igloo. She crept inside. This was a former tusk home, and yet in the hour she had taken and in the hour she had taken to forage for eggs, her friends had transformed the snowy dome. Flint had a fire going and above it, Blue had hung the magnifying glass infused with rainbow essence and from the inside of the igloo looked like a dark shape huddled at the foot of the cliffs. Inside it glowed every colour possible. Turquoise danced over the roof, purple flickered across the floor and gold shone on the walls. It's beautiful in here, Esker whispered, a pocket of Urkemold not yet ruined by the ice queen. Flint cracked the eggs onto a flattened stone he had placed above the fire, then he looked at Esker. We're going to find the frost horn, he said. However far out of the groaning splinters it is. But it's not just finding the, fawn, the horn, is it? Esker whispered. She thought of Root leading the Tusk Gods towards the Lost Chambers. It's everything that comes after that. Flowing it from the skies, getting the tribes to fight, fight with us, stopping the ice cream from changing Gurnka Wall forever. She looked down. So many things to hope for. Flint nodded. But think, but think back to where we come from. The music box, the giant's beard, the nether cliffs and the grey man outside guarding our sleep. It's going to be okay. We find Ma, Blue said. It wasn't a question, it was a fact, and Esker realised that hope moved quickly. It could burn inside you one minute, and then, just when you thought you'd lost it, you'd find it shining in the hearts of your friends. She looked around the igloo. So long as one of them remembered to bring hope with them, perhaps things would turn out all right. Chapter 29, Flint. As the sun rose over the horizon, big, pale and flooding, the groaning splinters with light, Flint, Blue, Esker and Pebble knelt on a flattened iceberg. The grey man stood out in, in, out in the sea, nudging the iceberg forward, and Flint stifled a yawn. He knew Esker hadn't noticed him creep out of the igloo in the night, but if he carried on yawning like this, she'd start to ask questions. And some things were better left unsaid, especially while the Ice Queen's anthem was going on and Esker's voice was little more than a wisp of breath. Flint glanced at Balapan circling above them. She has an unfair advantage in this quest, he muttered. Wings make all the difference. The grey man walked out for a while. Then he paused before a maze of iceberg bridges, arches and spiralled columns. I'll leave you here, he said. It seems like a perfectly reasonable place. But we need to get to the furthest of the groaning splinters, Esker whispered. We're not even among them yet. Flint nodded. It's not as if the wind is going to carry us. It's as calm as a mill pond this morning. Blue jabbed a little fist in both Esker and Flint's sides. Listen to Giant. He knows the way. The grey man smiled at Blue. For someone so small, you are actually rather wise. He stood back from the iceberg. And now for a spot of convenient twinned. He took a deep breath in and a stone body crunched as his chest swelled. Then he bent down, level with the iceberg the children sat on and let his breath out. The iceberg drifted across the water, steered by the giant's breath. And the group swung round as they realised what was happening. You're really not coming with us, Flint cried. The giant's breath continued to push the iceberg out, even though the ice man now stood still and tall. I cannot stay any longer. There is someone I need to speak with. He paused. But you will find the frost horn and together you will blow it from the stars. Flynn wondered whether he would be impolite to point out that the time was overdue for catch up with friends was probably out of the way now, just hours from the Ice Queen's domi um, domination over Urkemold. But there was something in the giant's eyes as he said goodbye, something kind, honest and wise, and Flint didn't press the matter further. Thank you, Esker whispered. And though the sound didn't reach the giant, waving from the shallows, Flint could tell that he knew the shape of those words because he smiled. The giant's breath steered the iceberg on towards the groaning splinters and had Flint's and Esker's minds not be filled with images of the ice cream wiping out the tribes and tearing down the sky gods if they failed to find the frost horn, they might have marvelled at the splendour before them as the spears and the domes and the caves of glittering blue ice. The iceberg drifted beneath an arch and on towards a row of spiked peaks. Does it seem a bit too quiet to you? Flint asked after a while. If you ignore this, the, the Ice Queen's anthem. He listened for the cries of the birds from the cliffs, but there was nothing now. He looked back towards the flatter icebergs where the seals had been resting. They were gone too. The iceberg glided on and Flint watched Balapan dipping low between the groaning splinters, as if perhaps she had seen something. He reached for his anything knife and, and Eska gri gri gripped her quiver. Then a sloping brown head slid above the surface in front of the iceberg. The group huddled on. Amber eyes, whiskers curling from a dark wet nose, two sharp white tusks hanging either side of a drooling mouth. One by one, more brown heads appeared until they surrounded the iceberg in a dark circle. Flint swallowed. Walruses. The giant's breath nudged the iceberg forward, but the largest of the walruses lifted its blubbery body out of the water, a fraction more, until it blocked the path through and the iceberg ground to a halt. 
They'll let us pass, won't they? Esker whispered. But when the largest walrus shook his blubber and let out a juddering roar, Flint knew there was no or these were no ordinary walruses. Like the wolves back in the Driftlands, these were now brutes cursed to obey the Ice Queen. Flint fumbled for his knife as a walrus thumped its enormous body onto the ice and stabbed at the children with its tusks. Blue screamed and Flint jabbed his boot into its head. Then, as it reared backwards, Esker sent a an arrow into the blubber. The walrus sank out of sight, but the others drew closer. Have you got an invention in your bag that can help us? Esker gasped. Flint's eyes widened as he remembered he had left his rucksack back in the igloo. The grey man had warned against extra weight on the ice, and Flint hadn't wanted to, lo to lose the, goo the snow goose eggs, uh, the snow goose feathers he'd carried this far in the depth of the icy sea. He, brand he brandished his anything knife as another walrus shunted its hideous body against their iceberg. Then Palapan dive bombed the beast, and it drew back for a second. They're trying to topple the iceberg, Flint cried. He pulled blue, beh blue behind him and plunged his anything knife into the neck of a walrus whose tusks were just centimetres from Esker's leg. The beast let out a low grunted whine, then it vanished beneath the surface. The air shook with the Ice Queen's anthem and the roars of the walruses as they hacked at the iceberg with their tusks, clawing closer to their prey. But Flint and Esker were in the hunt now, their aim sure and their weapons poised to kill. And Balapan was wielding her wings and talons above anything, anything that came close to Blue. Before long, just one walrus remained, the largest of the herd. It disappeared beneath the surface, and when Flynn glanced down, he could see only the water and the undersides of the turquoise icebergs. Has he gone? Esker whispered. The quietness dragged on, and Flint lowered his knife. Then there was an almighty boom from beneath as the walrus thrust its weight into the middle of the iceberg. It juddered, it groaned, and Flint's eyes widened. Then it crunched in two. Flint and Blue on one side, and Esker on the other. The walrus slid through the water towards the iceberg that Flint and Blue were stranded on, and though Balapan hurled down to try and distract it, the walrus merely battered the eagle away. Narrowing its yellow eyes, made a beeline for the iceberg. Keep going, Flint yelled at Esker. Use your bow as an oar until you reach the furthest of the groaning splinters. Then find the hot frost horn. The walrus slashed its tusks into the ice by Blue's boot, and then Flint wrenched his little sister away. He looked up to see Esker frantically trying to paddle towards them. Flint brandished his knife. The walrus held back for a moment. Turn round and keep going, he shouted again. This is your chance, Esker. I can fight the walrus. For a second, Flint saw Esker falter. Then she turned her terror-stricken face away and inched towards the last of the groaning splinters before the wide stretch of the ocean. Flint took a deep breath and he turned back to face the walrus. And that is the end of chapter 29. Um, so we'll have to see what happens to Flint and Blue who have been attacked. So um, hope you're enjoying the book. Stay safe and look after yourselves. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel and hopefully we'll see you all soon. You saying bye? Bye.